Good morning, friends. So glad you're with me today on this April 8th, 2022. I am looking forward to this time together with you on this Friday. Happy Friday to all those who are logging on live with me. Good morning, Malia. It's so good to see you. And if you are new around here, I would just love it if you would say hello in the comments. Let me know what city you are joining from and how you heard about walking through his word. And if you're a regular around here, just drop your favorite emoji so I know you have been with me in the past. Today we are gonna be going through Psalm 79. And so we have been walking through the Psalms through the last couple years, I guess we could say now. It's kind of hard to believe. Um, but I started this broadcast as just a way to connect with you, my readers and listeners and friends, especially during the pandemic, started when we had sheltering in place um, just beginning and things were shut down. But what I discovered along the way is how powerful it is for us to gather around God's word. And I'm so grateful for technology that enables me to do this from my office, so you're here in what we fondly call the library. You can see my books behind me. And this is um, just so sweet that I can be here in Fresno, California, in Central California, and so many of you can be in other places around the city, around the country, even around the world. We have people who join us from other countries on a regular basis, and we can unite in walking through God's word and praying together. So I just want to say good morning. Happy spring. Um, for some of us, spring is a little crazy. We actually hit 90 degrees here locally this week, which is like way too hot for spring as far as I'm concerned. And then I was seeing pictures of my friends who live in places where there is snow. So um, <laughs> it's just, it's so interesting how spring can bring us into so many different landscapes and different weather patterns. Um, I want to say good morning to my friend Andy who is over here on Facebook and also to uh, Teresa and Warren on Instagram, the Hutchinsons, Esther, I see my parents are here as well, Trisha, my husband Sean, and a special shout out to my friends who are part of the Widow Mama Collective Group that I help facilitate on Facebook as well as those who are part of the Lead Loved Group and the Glory Chasers Christian Running Group, which my husband Sean and I facilitate um, for walkers and runners. If you're interested in any of those groups, I just highly encourage you to check those out on Facebook or send me a DM and I will get a link to you. But now we are going to go ahead and dive into Psalm 79. And again, we are in a book of Psalms that is written by Asaph. So we read a bunch of Psalms that were written by David and probably most popularly people know the Psalms as being written by David, but there's actually this whole group of Psalms written by um, some of some others and including Asaph. And today's Psalm, Psalm 79 is another lament. Um, so if you're new around here, we've talked a lot about lament, but lament is an expression of sorrow. It's a crying out to God. It's an appeal to God. And this Psalm, Psalm 79, specifically is a community lament. So the way that Asaph wrote it was for the community to read it or to sing it together, crying out to God together. And it comes with a little bit of historical context that I want to touch on just before I start reading the actual verses. Because um, as I was reading some of the commentaries and doing a little bit of research on Psalm 79, discover that it was likely after the destruction of Jerusalem by Babylon. So this is a really big deal. Jerusalem being the holy city of the Israelites and this city was destroyed. It was um, full of people who lost their lives and even we're gonna see how the temple, the holy place, where they would meet with God was also destroyed. And so we have this context. And for those of us who are living here in 2022, I want you to imagine maybe some of the war-torn countries in our present age. You know, quickly Ukraine comes to mind 
as we have this war raging in the Ukraine with Russia. And I think about some other places around the world where war continues like in Afghanistan and Ethiopia. And so imagine what it would be like to be singing or saying the words of Psalm 79 if you are in one of those places right now, just to give us some context. And I think it's so important for us to also consider reading the Bible through the lens of different cultures, not just um, maybe our American worldview or our Western worldview, but for people who are in other parts of the world who might also be um, approaching the scriptures. I think it's a good exercise for all of us to recognize just the diversity that the scriptures reaches out to. So I'm going to go ahead and dive in. I will be reading today from Psalm 79 in the English Standard Version, which is the translation of the Bible that I like to start with. But I also love to consult some of the other translations and versions of the Bible because I think they give us just a rich understanding. There's some different language that's used in different translations, and it helps us to go deeper. There's different words and different descriptions that reach out to us in different ways. And so that's why I spend a little bit of time looking at those in comparison. So friends, if you want to read along, open up to Psalm 79. If you are commuting or running or walking, just listen in right now. And the little subtitle over the ESV version of Psalm 79 says, How long, O Lord? You're going to see that that is a very pertinent question in this psalm particularly. It says, O God, the nations have come into your inheritance. They have defiled your holy temple. They have laid Jerusalem in ruins. They have given the bodies of your servants to the birds of the heavens for food. The flesh of your faithful to the beasts of the earth. They have poured out their blood like water all around Jerusalem, and there was no one to bury them. We have become a taunt to our neighbors, mocked and derided by those around us. How long, O oh Lord? Will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy burn like the fire? Pour out your anger on the nations that do not know you and on the kingdoms that do not call upon your name, for they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his habitation. Do not remember against us our former iniquities. Let your compassion come speedily to meet us, for we are brought very low. Help us, O God, of our salvation, for the glory of your name. Deliver us and atone for our sins for your name's sake. Why should the nations say, where is their God? Let the avenging of the outpoured blood of your servants be known among the nations before our eyes. Let the groans of the prisoners come before you according to your great power. Preserve those doomed to die. Return sevenfold into the lap of our neighbors. The taunts with which they have taunted you, O Lord, but we, your people, the sheep of your pasture, will give thanks to you forever. From generation to generation, we will recount your praise. That's Psalm 79 from the ESV version. And it's a little bit shorter psalm this week. Last week, we read Psalm 78 with 72 verses. This week, we are looking at one with just 13 verses, um, but still full of so much nuance, so much emotion, and so many layers. So let's look at these verse by verse. Here's the whole idea of walking through God's word is that we would walk through verse by verse and see what we might discover about God and about ourselves as we read the text. And so I want to start off with this kind of first section, verses one through four of Psalm 79. And this section really kind of sets the stage um, Asaph, who is our author here, he is describing the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the Holy Temple. And so he talks about um, how there has been a defilement of the Holy Temple. It says, oh God, the nations have come into your inheritance. They have defiled your Holy Temple. They have laid Jerusalem in ruins. 
and I want to read for you Psalm 79 in the New Living Translation. is It's one of the translations that I've really been enjoying reading lately. It's not so much a word-for-word -word translation like the ESV, but it gives us a sense of what's going on. It says, Oh God, pagan nations have conquered your land, your special possession. They have defiled your holy temple and made Jerusalem a heap of ruins. They have left the bodies of your servants as food for the birds of heaven. The flesh of your godly ones has become food for the wild animals. Blood has flowed like water all around Jerusalem and no one is left to bury the dead. So the New Living Translation gives us this very vivid picture of the destruction that has happened here in Jerusalem that the Babylonians have come in they have conquered, they have killed. In fact, so many are dead that there's not even many living who can bury the dead. So we just imagine blood is flowing through the streets. And it's a really awful predicament that Asaph is describing. And then it he talks about how, you know, they are to be arrows pointing to God. They, as the Israelites, want to be the ones who are showing who God is and how faithful and how powerful he is. But right now in this situation, they are being taunted. They're being ridiculed because of this horrible loss and the destruction of the holy city. And that brings us to verse five, which is this famous question that is actually echoed throughout several of the Psalms. And that question is, how long, O Lord? How long, O Lord? Now, I can imagine that some of us who are reading this psalm today in April of 2022, we're asking that same question. How long, O oh Lord? How long, O oh Lord? Maybe you have a personal challenge, a personal circumstance. Maybe you're thinking about the pandemic. Maybe you're thinking about war in Ukraine or Ethiopia or other parts of the world um, or some of the difficult things that are going on in our country, and you too are asking that question, how long, O oh Lord? If that's you, I want to just urge you to type that question in the comments. How long, O oh Lord? And I, I just want to unite our hearts in prayer today here shortly that we can ask that question, how long, O oh Lord? And that he answers us. And so going back to the text, there's actually three questions here in verse 5. That's what I would call the key question, but it's followed up with these two questions. Will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy burn like fire? And so we see that Asaph actually is, you know, crying out to God in lament and leading this community lament, but he's also a bit confused. He's like, well, God, are you angry with us because our people are being killed? Our people are... Um, being defiled, your holy temple is being destroyed and defiled, your holy place is being brought down. And so we can relate that Asaph is asking this question, kind of wondering, have we done something wrong? Well, the truth of the matter is that yes, they have been unfaithful to the Lord. If we read through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. I just finished a Bible study this week on the book of Numbers. We see how again and again, God has been faithful. He has rescued and yet the people have not been faithful. The people turn away. The people are distracted by idols and those people are us. It is us included. And so the real question here is not how long will we suffer, but how long will you, God, how long will you allow the nations, these are the people, the Gentiles who do not know you, get away with destruction and evil? So this is the heart of the question. How long are you going to let them get away with this? Because we know that suffering is not something we are exempt from as believers in God as believers in Yahweh and this side of the cross believers in Jesus Christ. We will taste suffering and the Bible tells us this. But the question here is how long will evil prevail? And I'm sure that there are many of us who are asking that question today in our own context. And so in verses six and seven then, we see that Asaph is really calling out to God and asking him, can you pour out your anger on these people? 
on the ones who do not believe in you, on the ones who do not call upon your name, as it says in verse six, for they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his habitation, verse seven. I'm gonna read that in the New Living Translation. It says, pour out your wrath on the nations that refuse to acknowledge you, on kingdoms that do not call upon your name, for they have devoured your people Israel, making the land a desolate wilderness. And so we see the passion, we see the suffering, we see just how emphatic Asaph is in these lines, begging God to judge those who have destroyed his holy city. And that brings us to a very important section of this psalm. And if you've been reading the Psalms with me, you know that it is part of the pattern of how many of the Psalms are written, that then the people return to God and his character. And so in these verses, eight through 10, we see an appeal to God's character and to God's glory. And they want God's reputation to rise to the top. And so this is what we hear Asaph saying. He says, do not remember against us our former iniquities. Let your compassion Come speedily to meet us, for we are brought very low. So here's the first character quality of God that we see. He calls out to God. We know, we know God. We know that you are a compassionate God. We've experienced it in the past. And so as it says in the New Living Translation, let your compassion quickly meet our needs, for we are on the brink of despair. Friends, have you ever been on the brink of despair? Maybe you're on the brink of despair right now, today. Put a little emoji in the comments for me. Give me a little thumbs up if you have ever been on the brink of despair or if you're experiencing that today. I know there have been times in my life where I have experienced that, where I have been just right there on the ledge looking down into despair, just holding out there on the edge of despair. And here they are appealing to God's compassion. And so that's one of the character qualities that we can take away today is that God is a God of compassion. And so the people are reminding him that he is a God of compassion. And I can see that some of the rest of you who are joining me live today are dropping emojis in the comments and and just resonating, relating to what it feels like to be on the brink of despair. We're going to look at some of the other character qualities of God. In verse 9, it says, Help us, O God of our salvation, help us for the glory of your name. Save us and forgive our sins for the honor of your name. I'm reading that in the New Living Translation. And I love this because it is just the crux of the entire biblical narrative. It is the core of the gospel, that word salvation. And that salvation comes from God. And it's very interesting because Asaph is choosing in this moment to appeal to God's character quality of salvation. He knows that God cares about his people, that God is the Savior, and God intends to send his son Jesus in the future as a Savior. Now, Asaph didn't know that, but God knew that, right? And So God being our salvation is part of his character. And I love that it says here, help us for the glory of your name. Save us and forgive our sins for the honor of your name. And so really what he's doing is he's asking God for forgiveness. He's asking God for help and to save them. But what is the motive that we notice there? What's the motive? The motive, as he says in these lines, is for the glory and for the honor of God's name. Knowing that when God saves and rescues his people, that it allows others to know God's glory. It allows others to honor God. And so he's appealing to that. And again, that he wants God to be glorified. At the end of verse nine, it says, deliver us and atone for our sins for your name's sake in the ESV version. And I love that word atone comes from that longer word atonement. 
And as we are approaching Holy Week, as we are approaching Easter, as we celebrate it in the Christian faith, it is a celebration of that exact thing, of atonement. Atonement is God sending his son as a substitute for each one of us. That his son Jesus would come to earth as a baby boy, would minister here on earth, and then be killed, be murdered in place of every one of us who are sinners. And I know it's not popular to talk about sin in today's context, but here's the reality. All of us have been unfaithful to the Lord. And it is because of God's amazing and gracious and divine plan for our atonement that he would send his beloved son who was perfect as a substitute for every one of us so that he would die on the cross so that we might be forgiven of our sins, that we might enjoy that salvation that was talked about earlier. And I love that here, hundreds of years before Jesus came to earth, Asaph is crying out to God, how long, O Lord? And he is recognizing that God is a God of compassion. He's a God of salvation. He is a God of glory and all glory is due to God. So we see again that the psalmist is reminding himself and reminding us today of who God is. God is a helper. God is a deliverer. God is our atonement. And then we see in verse 10, it says, why should the nation say, where is their God? Let the avenging of the outpoured blood of your servants be known among the nations before our eyes. And it's because Asaph doesn't want these other nations to be laughing at God and laughing at them. He does not want God's reputation to be tainted. You know, I can relate to this. I remember um, seven years ago, when my husband was diagnosed with cancer. And I remember that um, so many of us were fervently praying for his healing. And I remember these prayers where I would cry out to God, how long, O Lord? Because I too was concerned about God's glory and his reputation. I was concerned about all those who were looking on in this situation so many little kids that were my children's ages and so many friends and some who had strong faith and some who were wavering in their faith. And I cried out, God, let this be for your glory. Those were my private prayers that I was worried about God's reputation. I was worried about the faith of my friends and about these children and about others who are looking on and watching our story. But in a sense, there was an arrogance in me to think that I understood how those prayers should be answered. And God still received the glory, even though my husband was not healed here on earth, his body was healed in heaven. And so I think about the situation even in the Ukraine today, where so many are losing their lives in horrible ways. I think about cases of racism and hate crimes that have gone on in our country in these last couple of years. And I think about evil in our world, things like sex trafficking that are destroying young women. And I cry out, I cry out and I say, how long, oh Lord? Because I do not want God's reputation to be tainted. But here's the beautiful thing. In verse 11, it calls out and reminds us who God is. In the New Living Translation, I love these words. It says, listen to the moaning of the prisoners. Demonstrate your great power by saving those condemned to die. As it says in the ESV, it says, let the groans of the prisoners come before you according to your great power, that same phrase, preserve those doomed to die. So here's the thing. God is still on the throne. God is still powerful. He is omnipotent. He is all powerful and he is omniscient. He knows all things, my friends. And so even though we might pray for a certain outcome, his way is higher. His glory is greater. And so we can depend on his great power. We don't have to depend on our own strength because frankly, my strength is actually weakness. 
but we can look to his great power. And that's exactly what Asaph is doing in this situation. He does not understand why the holy city, why Jerusalem, why all these Israelites have been struck down. And so he is calling out to God's great power. He is appealing to God's great power in this moment in Psalm 79. And so as we're marching on here in section, the last section of the psalm in verses 11 through 13, where Asaph is really reminding himself of God's great power. And then he has this phrase here in verse 12, return sevenfold into the lap of our neighbors, the taunts with which they have taunted you, O Lord. And it's basically saying, pay back our neighbors seven times for the ways that they have scorned you, God, for the ways that you've, they have made fun of you and hurled insults at you. Just, you know, multiply the the destruction that they have brought on us. And he's he's basically calling out to God and saying, hey, would you judge these people? And it's interesting that he uses that phrase sevenfold because in the Bible, the number seven is a complete number. It's a number that is symbolizing wholeness and completeness. And so in so many words here, Asaph is basically saying, bring complete reproach upon the Babylonians, upon those who have destroyed your temple. And he's appealing to God in that. And then we come to this final verse of Psalm 79 that says, but we, your people, the sheep of your pasture, will give thanks to you forever. From generation to generation, we will recount your praise. And so where we land is similar to where we landed last week with Psalm 78. Asaph is using this imagery of sheep, the sheep of your pasture, and acknowledging God as being the good shepherd. We see that in Psalm 23, where it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We see this in the New Testament, as Jesus is referred to as the good shepherd. He is the good shepherd to come. And as we anticipate this week of Easter, We can cling to that as well, that he is a shepherd who guides us, that we are the sheep of his pasture. And I love that even in this lament, even in crying out to God, even in his questions of confusion, that Asaph lands on giving thanks. May we learn from this. May there be a strong takeaway for each one of us that no matter what hard situation we are walking walking through today, no matter what kind of destruction we see happening around the world, what kind of evil we can identify, the injustice that we see, that God is still the good shepherd and that he is guiding us and he cares for us in a deep and personal way. I wanna read a scripture from 2 Chronicles 16, 9 that was actually here in my journal this morning as I was taking notes on Psalm 79. And here's what it says. It says, for the eyes of the Lord roam throughout the earth to show himself, that's a capital H, to show himself strong for those who are wholeheartedly devoted to him. I love this verse because it reminds us of the same thing that we just read about here in Psalm 79, that he is strong, that he is an all-powerful God that we can depend on him. And I wanna be counted as one who is wholeheartedly devoted to him. If you want that too, would you drop an emoji in the comments? If you wanna be known as a man or a woman who is wholeheartedly devoted to God, will you just say amen with me right now? May it be so. May we strive for that. It's not that we have to check boxes to earn God's love, but that we would be people who are wholeheartedly devoted to him. Amen, amen. I'm agreeing with my friends here on Instagram. I see my friend Malia and Carrie and Brett and Esther, so many of us saying amen. Let us be wholeheartedly devoted to him. So friends, today, I just want to give you this one takeaway as we move into prayer. God's grace is for us. And God's grace is for his glory, which brings others into his kingdom. 
And so as we consider Psalm 79 in the context of Holy Week, in the context of Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday that are coming here in the next few weeks, may we remember that God's grace is for our glory and to bring himself glory so others may know him. I'm going to go ahead and move into a time of prayer. And if anything that I shared today really pricked your spirit or touched your heart, or even if you have other prayer requests that are bubbling to the surface, just add them in the comments right now. Lord Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you that even in this psalm, these 13 verses, that we can glean and learn so much about you. God, thank you for being a God of compassion, a God who is centered on salvation. God, thank you that you are glory that you show us just glimpses of your glory every day, but that one day we will get to see you face to face and experience the fullness of your glory. God, I look forward to that today. I look forward to that. It is the hope that I cling to. I thank you, God, that you are a helper, that you are a deliverer as Asaph called out to you. Lord, remind us that we are not the judge, that you are the judge and that your ways are greater and higher than our ways. I wanna be one who is wholeheartedly devoted to you, who 100% trusts you, who's not making up these backup plans for if this prayer doesn't get answered, what am I gonna do? Because it doesn't rest in my hands, it rests in yours. And so Lord, I just declare today on April 8th, 2022, that you, are the king. And I thank you for being the good shepherd who cares about his sheep. God, I continue to pray for the situation that is happening in the Ukraine. I pray for the war-torn countries around the world, places like Ethiopia and Afghanistan and other countries that are also dealing with war that maybe are not so much in the news. God, we pray and we trust you. We trust in your great power. We pray that you would give us wisdom and discernment, that you would continue to show your compassion to every one of us, that we might be merciful towards others as you have been merciful to us. And I pray that in these special weeks to come, as we celebrate your resurrection, God, that others might come to know you in a personal way as well. Help us not to be afraid to share the ways that we have seen your glory, the ways that we have experienced you. And I pray that in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, thank you, friends, for joining me this morning. A couple minutes over. I think I got a little excited about Psalm 79. I didn't know there was going to be so much in there, such a richness. And I want to just encourage you to go back and read it in whatever translation of the Bible you have to underline what are those character qualities of God that I want to remember. If you're in a place where you are crying out, how long, O Lord, just know that you are not alone, that God invites us to ask those questions, that he meets us in our doubt and our discouragement. Friends, if we have not connected personally, I want to invite you to hop over to my website right now, darinagilmore.com. You can share your email there and I will send you my weekly glory gram. And I'm really excited about my glory gram this week that I'm going to be sending out probably on Saturday. Um, I am including some recommendations for spring break. So if you are looking for music, movies, um, TV series to watch with your family, I've got some fun recommendations in there. I also have a list of multicultural resources that you might incorporate in your Easter baskets. If you do Easter baskets for kids, I've got some fun books and other products that might be fun to purchase. And I just want to wish you a happy Easter. I will be back here next Friday for Good Friday. I have a special broadcast for Good Friday. I'm always here at 7 a.m. Pacific time on Fridays. And I just want to thank you for joining me today Please remember that you can always go back and watch the video. So if you didn't get a chance to hear the whole thing, you can hop over to my IGTV or my YouTube channel and you can watch it. And I love it when you comment or send me personal messages on Facebook or Instagram. I would be honored to be able to pray for you and whatever you're going through today. 
So friends, be blessed on this Friday and I'm praying some rest for you, especially those who are maybe embarking on some travel or some rest for spring break and I'll see you next Friday. Blessings to you.